Welcome to today's live q and I'm so happy to have you all here today. Welcome on in. Please say hello and where you're streaming in from today. And it's so great to have you all here. So today is a little bit of a wrap up and a catch up. If you missed yesterday's show, of course, the Dr. Jean show, which is live on Tuesdays, this is sort of the follow up Q&A that we do now on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it's great if you are catching today's live for the first time. Please say hello. Uh, Fariba, hello in California. Nice to see you. Thank you for tuning in. And I'll be able to answer some of your questions. Seuss Lover in India is here. Mona's Hota in London. Nice to see you. Uh, Mia is here from London. Nice to see you. Great Britain. The UK is in the house. Hello, hello. I'm Dr. Janine, naturopathic doctor. And of course, on Tuesdays, we always have our live show. We go through different health topics. And I'm going to review a little bit of that today. We have, of course, my my screen behind me that if you want to pull up any information that you maybe want to review from yesterday's show or if you're watching for the first time then what we can do is do a little bit of a review and of course go into some of those subject matters so what we did talk about yesterday was fertility issues how that's related to something called leptin resistance now if you don't know what leptin resistance is this is really important that you are learning about this it has a lot to do with weight gain I've got my little props here so let's take out Mr. Fat yeah so if you're having difficulty with that weight gain, this is something, figuring out that leptin resistance, if you have it or not, really important. That's something that we'll talk about. And of course, do a little review. Maybe I should keep Mr. Fat right here. Yeah, nice and handy. There we go. As well as how leptin resistance causes an imbalance in your hormones. That's what we talked about and how that's related to fertility issues. And we have a couple slides about that. So if you want to hear anything in specifics, then please let me know. Put your questions in the comment section. I'm here for a bit to answer your questions. I wasn't able to get to all the questions yesterday, but it's so great to have you all here. And it's, it's amazing when I'm able to go live and to actually interact with all of you. And here we go. I've got myself here that I can see. And if there's any specific comments that are coming in, I'm going to try to catch everything. Okay. Hello, Stacy in Michigan. Nice to see you. Thank you for tuning in. And okay, Vicky's asking a great question. So we talk often about cold therapy and Vicky's asking, what is the best time to do cold pack therapy? Well, it really depends on what you're wanting to target. Um, helping that leptin reception and your leptin receptors is something that you want to target. I like it when you're in a more relaxed sort of state because what the cold does is it can kind of... Um, invoke a little bit of a stress response when you're not used to doing it at the beginning. So you don't want to do that too, too close to bedtime. I like the early evening. If you're watching a program or you're studying, you're learning, you're at, that's a great time to put ice packs on the body. Of course, after doing a, any type of heat therapy, that's a great time to do it as well. So after a sauna, after a hot shower, then you switch the your shower over to the cold, as cold as you can stand it, that's a great time to do it as well. And you always want to end in cold. So that's the tip for cold therapy to maximize um, your mitochondrial health. You want to always end in cold. That helps your immune system as well. And hello, hello, please say hello and where you're from. Uh, I wonder if we can, if I can just hear you, if you can talk in my ear for just a second, because I'm trying, yeah, okay, there we go. I just want to make sure I'm turning you up so that I can hear my producers in my ear. So that's, uh, I, if I miss any questions, and you may need to put it in the comments a few times. I do have my team, so if you see any comments from Team Dr. J9, that's my team behind the scenes. They help me to answer questions as well. White Hill, hello, Susan. Nice to see you. Thank you for tuning in. It's so great to have you here today. And I know that you're a regular, um, you know, attendee to all of my content. So thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, we've got some questions, again, about fertility. And is hot water related to infertility? Then I'm not sure about that question, Gabriel Lazoid. I'm not sure exactly like hot, like getting in the hot water for the guys for fertility issues. I often talk about cold therapy is fantastic, but heat therapy is also good uh, for increasing your mitochondrial health and turnover and, and autophagy and all these things. We did talk about autophagy yesterday as well. So for fertility, tying that back to the leptin resistance, that's what we spoke about yesterday. Um, so I'm not sure if, if you're... Uh, question is around, you know, getting too hot can slow down sperm motility and numbers, which is true to a certain degree, but always counteracting that with the cold shower, I think would be a great way to sort of um, counteract that. 
Okay, showering, yes. Yeah, so I was going in the right direction. Uh, Gabriel, yes. So yeah, so the hot, if you're counteracting it with the cold, that's why you always end if you can. Uh, and I, I wimped out uh, today. I had my hot yoga class and I wimped out a little bit. I only got to probably 20 seconds today of the cold. I'm like, I'm done. I thought my best record is two minutes of like super cold water, as cold as it can go. How uh, is everybody else doing with their cold showers? Please put it in your in the comments. How long do you do your cold shower for? I'm, I need to be inspired perhaps if you're over two minutes that would be fantastic thank you thank you thank you to everybody who's tuning in today i'm dr janine and it's so great to have your questions coming in okay so questions around supplementation that's another thing that we talked about yesterday fake vitamins and how do you know that your vitamins are and this is a question that came through how do you know that your vitamins are fake okay so i'm going to give you some little tidbits because i know some vitamin questions are coming in as well how do you know if your vitamins are fake i want you to check your vitamin labels and if you, number one, don't see the word whole food vitamin on it, that now is suspect that it's probably a synthetic vitamin. Then you're going to look and you can see on the screen behind me that long laundry list, especially in a multivitamin, this is a multivitamin that we see on the screen, that long laundry list of all those different vitamins. Now it's going to say what the nutrient is and then it's going to say in brackets where it's derived from. Now if it's not saying that it comes from a fruit like you know, acerola cherries as an example for vitamin C, if it just says ascorbic acid, it's not telling you the source, it's not telling you that it's a whole food source, then you know that it's synthetically derived. And the big ones to really look out for, you know, we talked about folic acid yesterday, which is not natural, and that's something that you have to be aware of. So absolutely, you know, making sure that you are taking clean, clean vitamins without the fillers, without, oh yeah, we need to grab, if somebody can grab me the fillers and flow agents, that's what I forgot to grab before we came out live today, uh, the little white bags. I think it's in somebody's office, maybe. Uh, we're going to grab that for you. Nice to see you in India, Puneet. Thank you for tuning in. And how... Um, how great it is to have you all here today and when we talk about yes okay so i see a few questions coming in on turmeric as well and chronic inflammation so remember with leptin resistance uh, which we talked about in yesterday's show leptin resistance one of the markers for leptin resistance and here we see it on the screen behind me is that high inflammation in the body. So one of the markers that you can have done in your blood work is the highly sensitive CRP. So if that number is high, it really should be around one and under if it's high. I've you know talked to people that are left in, thank you, their left in, um, sorry, their CRP numbers were like up around 15 or so. That's a huge amount of inflammation in the system. And it's something that you definitely want to be aware of that that is an indicator for leptin resistance. So making sure that you're optimizing your leptin signaling, which we see behind me and, you know, following some of my tips and I can go through my tips again um, for those of you who want to, and Neha has a great question. How can you gain weight? Because if your weight is too low, that's an indication of leptin resistance as well, which was something that we did in fill in the blanks yesterday. Weight gain or weight loss can be a sign of that leptin resistance which we see behind me. So let's go through the tips really quickly because if you are here for the first time, please put a one in the comments. Thank you for hitting that follow that share button as well. And my new subscriber, thanks. Kathy's in the house. Nice to see you. One minute of your cold showers. Amazing, amazing, good job. And it's so great to have you all here. Okay, so let's go through some of the tips to fix your leptin resistance. Okay, so this is if you're overweight, so you're having difficulty getting that fat off. If you're underweight, you're trying you know, to gain that weight and you're really having a hard time doing that. It could be related, again, I've got my thyroid here. So if you've been diagnosed with hyperthyroid, so your thyroid is overactive, so your metabolism is too quick, it could, again, be related to that leptin resistance. So let's go through the tips really quickly. And Sandy, your CRP was high, was high. so leptin resistance. Yeah, so these tips are gonna be really important. Uh, Shabana, nice to see you from India. Thank you for tuning in. Hello, hello. And okay, so the more questions coming in about um, the bones, osteoporosis issues, I'm gonna flip over after we go through these tips for leptin resistance, let's go and take a look at some of the information that I shared in yesterday's show um, about the osteoporosis and making sure that our bone density is on track, okay? And helping, and what you can do to supplement for bone density specifically, but you gotta fix the leptin resistance for the osteoporosis. Okay, and that's what we talked about. So let's look at the tips first to fix the leptin resistance. This is related to the osteoporosis. So for that question coming in, uh, Martha, yes, really important. Okay, here we go. 
Number one, you wake up with the sun and you see the sunlight. How many people put a sun in the comments? If you woke up with the sun today, you saw that sun, or at least you saw natural light. So you got out of your home, you took off, you know, if you, these are blue light blocking glasses, they're not corrective lenses, they're for the, blocking the artificial light. Um, if you took off your glasses, you didn't have contacts on, you saw some natural sunlight. And if you took your shoes off as well, very important. Brendy, thank you for the follow. Tony, babe, thanks for the follow. Great to have you. Okay. Uh, is it, I don't know how to pronounce that. Atunes, Joanna, Joanna. I don't know how to say that, but Joanna Atunes, yes, sunshine, awesome, awesome. Arjun, yes, saw some sunshine. Bizib, Lamar, um, you all saw some great sunshine. Murray, Karen, yes, amazing, amazing. I see lots of Sabrina, Kathy, Brenda, Sean. Everybody got out, and Rainer05, you got up and you saw that natural sunlight. That is tip number one, super important for your circadian rhythms, for your leptin signaling, all your hormones for that matter, for your weight loss, for your weight gain. See that early morning sunlight, even if it's just a couple of minutes, even if it's 30 seconds, it's okay. Jerry, no sun in the UK today, but yes, it was fresh and it was good. Okay, that's good. As long as you get out into natural light outside, you got to go outside or open a window. If you can't get outside, you're opening a window, see the sun. Number two, eat a big breakfast. How many people had their breakfast? Put a two in the comments if you had a big breakfast today. Awesome, awesome, I hope so. I hope you had a good healthy breakfast. That's really important to stimulate your circadian rhythms, your digestion for the day. Uh, Jerry had a good healthy breakfast, amazing, amazing. Thanks for those hearts coming through. I see that happening, awesome, awesome. Okay, yes, okay, good. Celeste Bezib, Bezib had a great breakfast. Hillary had a great breakfast as well. Okay, awesome, that's great for your leptin signaling, of course for balancing your hormones and for your metabolism as well. Okay, number three, of course, we see is light environment mimics your sunlight. So just start to be very aware of this in your home because we all have artificial lights and it's to our own detriment that we have artificial lights that we can just flip on the light whenever we need more light in our environment. So as follow the sun, just think about the sun, where the sun is at. When it's rising, you wanna have a little bit gradual light increasing in your home. When it's you know midday, full bright sunlight, maybe it's a little bit brighter in your unnatural environment indoors. At the very least, open a window whenever you can because that's gonna bring in that natural sunlight, sending those proper signals to all of the cells in your body because our skin has all of these you know light receptors, our brain, our gut, really, really important, okay? And our eyes especially as well. Then as the day is winding down, as the sun is setting, it's getting darker, you also kind of want to do that with your light environment. And at nighttime, after the sun has set, it's dark. It's supposed to be dark in your environment, okay? So this is super, super important, especially if you have any type of hormonal issues. I see questions coming in about vitamins for hormonal imbalances. Yes, there are, but you've got to get this stuff under control first. Absolutely. I can talk a little bit more about vitamins in just a second. So remind me, my team, please, to come back to the vitamins question. I will come back to that for balancing the hormones as well. Okay. Then we have, of course, no food after sunset. So when it gets dark, we're not meant to be eating. And this is really important for your leptin signaling. So going to bed on a somewhat empty stomach and not spiking, and that means drink as well. So any drink that doesn't have, you know, sugar, anything that's going to spike your blood glucose levels is going to be okay. Um, so I do like herbal teas in the evening, but no sweetener or anything in there to make sure that your blood glucose levels are dropping nicely before bed. And that will really have a beneficial effect on your, on your sleep as well, which is important and for balancing your hormones for your thyroid. Of course, as well, you've got to be in that sort of fasted state when you go to sleep because your thyroid secretion hormones are highest at nighttime. And okay, Number five, we started today the Q&A talking about cold exposure. And I know some of you are up to two minutes. Yes, Sabrina's up to two minutes on your, on your cold showers. Amazing, amazing. That's not easy to do. So good, good job. Okay, amazing. And also prioritize, of course, your sleep. So some of those other, you know, things that we talk about, like tip number one that we see here, waking up with the sun and seeing the sun actually helps your melatonin later in the day. So you need to have that natural sunlight exposure to make your serotonin, which converts into your melatonin for sleep. It's released, of course, from the pineal uh, when you're sleeping for that good night's sleep. Okay, awesome questions. I see so many coming in. Okay, where do I start? What's a great breakfast? Housekeeping by Lisa. I love eggs. Eggs are fantastic. If you do have carbohydrates, like for instance, what I have a lot of my mornings is um, poached eggs and sourdough uh, toast. 
a little bit of grass-fed butter on there. And I always have my tea. I start my tea. Who else starts their day with tea in the morning? Roberta, thank you for the follow. So great to have you here. Sarah Khan, thank you for the follow. Wilson, thank you for the follow as well. Uh, uh, Joanna, can you eat walnuts after sunlight? Yes, so that after the sun has set, I believe that's what you mean. It's why I do have a post on that. So there are like some, if you really are starving after the sun has set and you feel like you need to eat something, there are some nuts and things that you could, you could get away with eating and not really spike your blood glucose levels. So I do have a post on that. You can check it out. And if you're ever looking for any content, so what I want you to do, and here's a little trick, um, which has helped so many of my followers, that if you're looking, oh, I wonder if Dr. Jean has a, has a, post on headaches or fibromyalgia or whatever. So just in whatever platform you're on, just go into the search bar, uh, that little like looking glass thing, and just type my name, Dr. Janine Bowering, and then type that subject that you're looking for. Most times you're going to find a video. And if you don't find a video, I want to know that. So put it in the comments of the other videos and say, hey, and you may need to put it a few times. Hey, I need to, um, you know, see a video on this and use that hashtag okay so use that hashtag hashtag ask dr janine and that will help to populate some of these platforms more quickly that i can actually see and my team can see what the demand is what we definitely need to make sure that we're doing Okay, so we're coming back. So I did have a bunch of questions about vitamins. How do we know that vitamins, and this is something that we talked about yesterday, specifically folic acid, which is synthetic. Folic acid is not natural. So cycling back to that, how do you know if your vitamins are fake or not? Well, you're gonna look for something called whole food vitamins on the label. And when you look at the actual ingredients on your vitamin label bottle, well, you're gonna look in brackets. Where does it come from? What is the source? What are the things that are listed there? For instance, vitamin B12, it says cyanocobalamin. Well, that is fake vitamin B12. It actually has cyanide in it, fake folic acid. And this is actually what I would consider a mis um, labeling because folate is natural and in brackets it says folic acid. So folate and folic acid are not the same thing. Folic acid is the source for this one, which is synthetic. It's fake. It's not real. It's a chemical. It's chemically derived. Not good for your body. And that what we talked about yesterday in yesterday's show, some of the side effects of taking this fake folic acid, especially in fortified foods like breads and cereals and things. And I, I gave the example of you know, giving some cereal, what you think is a healthy cereal to, or oatmeal or whatever that's been fortified, or even you're going more plant-based or you're having, and you know, like the plant milks or the almond milk, the oat milk, whatever, and it is fortified almond milk. Well, you look at the label and it says folic acid in it. You know that that's a chemical. It's not natural. It looks like it's a vitamin, but it's not. It's a chemical and it can be hyper stimulating. So you give this to your kids, a bowl of cereal, you know, and they're like hyper, they can't focus at school. It could be because of these fake synthetic vitamins. And that's why I educate. I've got five kids and I, I love to educate, especially moms and dads, um, about, you know, really paying attention because there's a lot of misinformation out there as to what's healthy. And as you can probably agree, give me a thumbs up. I know that a lot of people are here because you trust, you know, all the research that I do. And of course, being a mom myself, that this is something that's, it's so important that that we not only for ourselves as parents but for our kids as well our grandkids that we take care of our our what we do of course naturally and doing it to the best of our ability hello and hello thank you for the follow nice to have you here olivia sobel 99 thank you for joining today and aa thank you for sharing today's live it's so great when you guys share and thank you for all my new subscribers and followers it's so great to have you here yes okay i see some thumbs up in agreement we definitely need to take care of our children's health it's so important and there is a lot of misinformation out there amber thank you for the follow so great to have you here today thank you for joining in and okay what what are some good cereals to buy? That's a good question. So you want to make sure that they're not fortified. So you just have to look, you have to be a label reader and start reading, um, making sure that they're not fortified. Of course, making your own organic oatmeal or whatever it is could be. Helen, thank you for the share. I think you shared like 15 times there. Thank you, Helen. Awesome job. Thank you so much. That's very generous of you. Thank you for sharing with your friends because it's so great because the community is growing and growing here at the Dr. Janine Show and now at Ask Dr. Janine. So use that hashtag, Ask Dr. Janine. And, you know, it's amazing because your questions are the best and I love to see them in. Philip, thank you. So nice to have you here. Carol, nice to see you. Hello, hello. And Lori's here from Pennsylvania. Um, okay, which questions did I, did, sorry, foods for weight gain. 
So protein, <laughs> you need more protein. If you, you gotta build muscle mass. Muscle mass helps with your overall metabolic function. A lot of people, I find with women especially, tend not to eat enough protein. So, you know, going a little bit, you know, into the healthy proteins, that's definitely whenever you can do pasture raised, grass fed, whenever you can. Now that's not realistic for everyone because of the cost and sourcing, you know, reputable uh, sources for your animal products. Now for the vegetarian, sometimes it's difficult. Okay, here we go, fish. Uh, really good for the vegetarians. Um, it could be difficult to get a complete protein. So you really have to watch your grains, your lentils, your beans, that they're in the right combination to get enough protein. So really optimizing your protein. High fiber is really good here. We see some good sources here. So meat, chicken, um, it looks like we've got some fish here. We have some nuts and seeds, eggs, eggs, eggs are amazing. And I always now, I'm really optimizing um, my own protein right now. And I always experiment to see, okay, how many grams is, is good for me and my weight training and all these things. So I've, I've done a good job in the last month or so and, and the gains that I'm seeing in terms of my strength, because as we age, as you know, especially ladies, you know that we've got to maintain our strength because we're losing that muscle mass, of course, as we age, I think it's like two or three percent um, every year after the age of 40, and that's kind of scary, right? So it's called sarcopenia. So we want to maintain our muscle mass. So how do we optimize getting enough protein? And, and fish, seafood, I, I'm a big seafood lover, and um, getting enough seafood is really important, of course. And yeah, we can see here eggs. I'm, I'm big on eggs. And the other thing that I supplement with is a protein powder. So I actually take uh, a whey uh, isolate, which is 100% isolate protein powder. It's super easily digested because not all are super clean formula, super clean uh, protein powder. So that's what I take. And I, I found now that when I make sure that I'm optimizing my protein by adding in that protein, and you're supposed to have one, one scoop is 20 grams of protein, plus I have 10 grams of collagen. So I'm at 30 grams, you know, after my workouts. I'm doing like a scoop and a half. I thought, okay, well, well, it's another 10 grams, you know, of the protein powder is not going to kill me. It's going to, and I've really noticed in terms of muscle um, strength, a big difference. And I've only been, you know, optimizing that for a month now. So that is the power of it. Neha, boiled egg or cooked egg. Yeah, I like poached eggs. I'm into poached eggs right now. Helen, thank you for more shares. I see that happening. So yeah, poached eggs are great. Any any type of way to eat the eggs is good. Uh, awesome. Uh, Keanu, co cotton cheese. Yeah, cottage cheese, I think is what you meant. Yes, absolutely. Um, and if your eggs are pasture raised, so I know that there's, um, you know, different types of eggs and the, you, you can watch videos and movies about this, pasture raised versus uh, free range and all these things. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there. So pasture raised eggs are the best. So knowing where your eggs come from is really amazing. Jerry, thank you for all those shares. I see that coming through. Thank you so much. You're so generous. Amazing, amazing. Um, okay, so let's look at now osteopenia, osteoporosis. Yes, I promised I would circle back to that. So White Hill One, Susan, I think is your name, right? Um, yes. So here we go. So making sure, I don't know, can we see the spine here? making sure that we're optimizing our bone density. Let me pull Ricky into <laughs> the shot. Here we go. Optimizing our bone density, especially as we age as women, and, and I better not do that because it's going to fall on the floor, um, is so important. So we talked yesterday about osteoporosis and how this is related back to the leptin resistance and your leptin signaling. And we'll come back to the tips really quickly um, about the how to fix the leptin resistance in just a second but remember leptin is a hormone given off by your fat cells and this is has to do with your brain now reading that signaling from leptin to your brain and when this gets messed up when you have the actual leptin resistance and that chronic inflammation in the body is one of those telltale signs that you've got the leptin resistance what happens is that you're going to block osteocalcin now osteocalcin is in your bones it's produced by the osteoblast and what it helps to do is it helps to bring and trap calcium with the use of vitamin K2 as well and deposit that calcium in the bone. So when your osteocalcin is blocked because you've got the high leptin and the leptin resistance, now you're developing osteoporosis just because your hormones were out of balance to begin with. What else contributes to leptin resistance? 
blue light toxicity, EMF, so being on our devices, our phones and all these things, not great for our natural circadian rhythms and our, all of our hormones being properly secreted. So this is why I'm so big on you know, getting outside, getting some natural sunlight, trying to decrease your exposure to EMFs. I know it's really hard in our modern world because we're surrounded by electronics. That's our life for a lot of us. Um, that's how we work. That's how we communicate for a lot of ways. But it's really important that you need that osteocalcin to be working properly to actually deposit into the bone. Now, this is linked back to what we talked about last week and last week's show as well, to the insulin resistance. So it's usually the leptin problem that happens first before you get the insulin resistance. And if we look at this slide really quickly behind me, you can see how the osteocalcin is related back to your insulin synthesis and your beta cell proliferation in the pancreas that links back with your insulin back to the bone and back to your osteocalcin. So you can see how this is so important that we're optimizing our leptin signaling that we don't have that high, high leptin, you know, that isn't being read properly by the body, that which creates more leptin resistance, that we are getting this all under control to maintain our bone density, which is so important. So I hope that answers that question. I know that there are questions about supplementation. So how do we keep our bones healthy? Well, first, you know, we're dealing with the leptin resistance. We're stabilizing blood sugar levels because that, again, really is related. As you can see, the pancreas is related back to your bone density as well, keeping the sugars low. So watching the carbohydrates in the diet, having that big high protein and healthy fat breakfast, really, really important to start the day. But the supplements that I like, uh, of course, for bone health is your vitamin K2 with a whole food calcium. So a coral calcium, which of course is taken closer to bedtime and your magnesium and your vitamin D3. So natural sunlight exposure, of course, if you can't get it, then a vitamin D3 supplement. Those are taken together in the morning. Yes, so remember yesterday's quiz, MM, somebody t please tell me. I know my regulars who are here, you're gonna fill it in. What does MM mean, according to Dr. Janine? Thank you for the Follow Sunset Reggae Kitchen. Nice to have you here. Thank you. If you're here for the first time, please say hello and put a one in the comments. Great to have you here. Panda May has it. Yes, MM, magnesium in the morning. And I know it goes against everything that you've heard. Take magnesium closer to bedtime. It helps with sleep. No, I've always said take magnesium in the morning. Magnesium works on your metabolism of your carbs, your fats, your protein throughout the day. Helps to regulate your heartbeat during the day. And your stresses happen, regulating that nervous system and, you know, your connectivity and your enzyme function. We need magnesium for like hundreds and hundreds of different uh, chemical reactions in the body. So MM, magnesium in the morning to help with all of that throughout the day. Yes, moms of Sophia, Michaela, you got that right. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Jazzy girl, you, yes, why not take the magnesium closer to bedtime? Because of all of the stress. Your metabolism is typically, if you're not a shift worker, your metabolism, all your, your heart function and that stress relief and your nervous system needs, you need that benefit and for muscle function throughout the day, if you're getting twitches and things, you need the magnesium in the morning and then you need your calcium. So the whole food calcium, like a coral calcium closer to bedtime because calcium actually goes into your bones and is best going into your bones when you secrete more growth hormone. So this is important. And of course, with that proper leptin signaling, that leptin, the osteocalcin connection and getting that calcium and your other minerals to actually go into the bones with your vitamin K2, super important. So that, and the, the calcium, I'm telling you, a, a good whole food coral calcium gives you the best night's sleep of your life and you have good dreams and sometimes inspirational dreams. Amazing, amazing. So making that switch for a lot of people is something that I've educated people probably for what, I'm gonna say 14 years now. Um, 13, 14 years, and yeah, when you make that switch, is it, it makes all the difference in the world, okay? So Nello, you take your magnesium at night. I know most people do, but I'm telling you, if you take a magnesium bisglycinate in the morning, and of course, your, um, your coral calcium closer to bedtime, amazing. I saw a question about um, somebody reacts to magnesium bisglycinate. Just make sure that there's no fillers. So here we go. Let's talk about fake vitamins. Let's talk about some of the things to really make sure you're not in your vitamins. So everybody take a look at this. Magnesium. It's not magnesium. This is magnesium stearate. So, or it may say on your vitamin label, vegetable stearic acid, vegetable based magnesium stearate. It's not natural. This is a chemical. It's a white powder. And what it does is it helps to speed up production times for the vitamin companies. And you do not want to be ingesting this stuff. And that's what people are reacting to in a lot of vitamins. So 
I don't think I've ever met anybody who has reacted to magnesium bisglycinate if it's in its pure form. It's a, if it's in a clean vitamin, not a fake vitamin, in a clean vitamin that doesn't have the fillers and the flow agents. The other big one is the microcrystalline cellulose. So that is the filler that they use in supplements. This can cause you to react as well. You've got to be aware of these things. Silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide. You don't want to ever see this on any label. It's so funny. I went to buy some toothpaste yesterday. And there were some from natural brands on the shelf. And I thought, oh, this is, and it was on sale. And I'm like, oh, this is a great deal. So I was looking and I picked it up and I was about to walk away with it. And then I thought, well, maybe I better just double check the ingredients. And sure enough, it had titanium dioxide. Now here's this crazy thing about titanium dioxide. If you're in the UK, if you're in Europe, if you're in France, this isn't allowed in your products anymore, okay? This has been outlawed and they're phasing it out of the entire European Union. This went into effect in France about three years ago that they got rid of it. Now it is allowed here in North America. So crazy, crazy town, right? It's, it's insane. But this is, these are the things that I like to educate you about so you can make better decisions when you're purchasing things that you think are even natural. That's a scary thing. You think you're buying a natural vitamin or a natural toothpaste or a natural bread or whatever, sourdough bread, and it's fortified or an almond milk and it's fortified with these fake vitamins. You've got to be aware of this, okay? So uh, Tam Breezy has a great question. Okay, we're going to be talking about something next week, I'm not gonna give it away, is coffee okay to have or do, does it deplete your magnesium? Now it does deplete your magnesium a little bit. So coffee is fine and I'm, I love coffee. Now recently I've actually given up caffeinated coffee for about a month now and loving the benefits of that. And if I do have um, you know, something with caffeine, it really does give me that extra boost. So I, I'm, I'm loving that. But coffee, I think coffee is great. It helps with your liver um, in terms of your phase one detox in your liver. Just don't overdo it. And that's where I think people, you know, there's a fine line between ha having, it's all about the dosage. And that's what we often say in natural medicine as doctors that we say it's all about, you know, the, the efficacy and the poison is in the dose. So having too much is not a good thing and everybody's different. So, uh, but it does deplete your magnesium. So you don't want to have it at the same time as your magnesium. Yes, questions? Oh, here's a question that came up. Yes, again, talking about vi vitamins and fake vitamins. Big misconception, taking vitamin K2 and your D3 together at the same time. No, 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 no. Because what can happen, in, and this is why I like magnesium and D3 first in the morning and your K2 with your calcium closer to bedtime. Because you want that K2 to make sure that that calcium is going into the bones, into the teeth, directing that calcium where to go. If you take K2 and D3 together at the same time, there's a possibility of something called hypercalcemia, too much calcium coming out of the bones into the blood. So I don't like that combo. And I know most supplement companies, they put them together, the D3 and the K2. I don't like it. I prefer, and you'll, you'll, once you start making these changes, like they're just little tweaks that you're making to your, your vitamin routine and your minerals as well, your magnesium bisglycinate in the morning and your calcium at night. Of course, with your D3 in the morning, your K2 away. Yes, they both need to be taken, but your K2 is closer to bedtime. I hope that helps. Is magnesium oxide okay? Anita Furman, I do not like magnesium oxide. It can cause uh, some not so great side effects. It's one of the least bioavailable types of magnesium to, and one of the least expensive as well. That's why a lot of people take it. Um, not great bioavailability. And the problem with the magnesium oxide is that they've always got to put these fillers and flow agents into those types of magnesium supplements. So I don't like that. One of the big reasons why I prefer magnesium bisglycinate over all of the other types of magnesium, and I've got different posts on magnesium. So again, in, in the platform after today's live, the Q&A, I want you to go in um, and just search, you know, different types of magnesium with my name, and then you're going to find some of those videos that I talked about and why. Why I don't like some over the others, why my favorite is magnesium bisglycinate, bound to glycine. Now, glycine is important, and this amino acid is very much depleted. So if you eat anything with wheat or oats that has glyphosate, if, you know, that big pesticide that are more so, you know, uh, a problem. It's been banned in certain countries um, on the other side of the world, but here in North America, it's the most prevalent um, herbicide that they use in modern farming. And unfortunately, this glyphosate residue depletes our own glycine. And glycine works like a neurotransmitter. And that's why one of the reasons why I really like the magnesium bisglycinate, because you're getting two 
glycines. And I saw some questions, what about magnesium glycinate? That's just one. I like the bis glycinate, two glycines. The more glycine you get, the better for your neurotransmitters for your nervous system. I hope that helps. Um, okay, yes, great question about gut health and probiotics, something that we talked about in last week's show. So please check out that episode on my long form videos. You're going to find that. And of course, menopausal weight gain. So yes, going back to the leptin resistance that we talked about yesterday, any type of hormonal upset, perimenopausal, menopausal, ladies, you've got to fix the leptin resistance. You've got to fix the leptin resistance, your circadian rhythms, and this is, this is step one. That will help to then with, and Husna is asking about insulin resistance. This is going to help with the insulin resistance. This is going to help with balancing those blood sugar levels. This is going to help with that weight gain that happens, of course, at menopause and perimenopause as well, okay? So that's really important. Night sweats, yes, same, same scenario. So the night sweats, so now it depends. You know, if you're a perimenopausal, menopausal woman with the night sweats and the hormonal changes, that's one thing because as the hormones are changing, of course, um, it's, there's uh, dysregulation happening and that's why optimizing, and there's herbal medicines that you can take that are really effective for the night sweats, like black cohosh, um, which I love, chase tree berry, amazing as well. Maca, which is an adaptogenic herbal medicine. That's something that I I take every night is a, a preparation for women. It's a herbal supplement that I take. Um, amazing for the hot flashes. Now that coral calcium that we talked about earlier, if you're just streaming in, we talked about, you know, vitamin K2 and coral calcium, that combination together, really great because often women, when you're calcium deficient, you will have those night sweats and then you start supplementing with the calcium. And then of course, and of course your magnesium and your D3 in the morning, no more hot flashes, no more night sweats. Okay. So that's really important as well. Uh, I hope I answered that. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, can the detox be done for someone who has colon issues, fatty liver? Absolutely. And any type of full body detox that, you know, I often talk about, and you can check out all my um, videos about full body detox. That's something that you can really, you know, delve into and some of the herbal medicines that I love. Then, yeah, absolutely for fatty liver and for digestive problems because the, here's the thing with doing detoxes and cleanses that you've got to make sure that you're addressing all of the internal organs at once a lot of cleanses if they're just focusing on the liver they're just focusing on the colon they're just focusing on the lymphatics they're just focusing on the kidneys is you could be forcing those toxins and this is one of the things that I share when I'm on television I give a demo that forcing those toxins from one toxic place to another and then that other organ where you're forcing those toxins to can't deal with that toxic load. So this is why, yeah, and this is why it's important that to do a well-rounded full body detox that is working on the colon, the liver, the lymphatics, the blood, and all of the internal organs, the skin, the kidneys, all at once with the herbal medicines to really help to, you know, alleviate that toxic load and doing it in a gentle way. I mean, everybody's different and in terms of dosage, how you do the, those full body cleanses. You can also do the foot detox bath. I don't know if we can bring that up. That would be great. If I don't know if we can find it behind the scenes. My, my team is just behind that door over there. So I, I always look over there like, but they, they, they can't physically see me because we're not in the same room. But yes, I don't know if we can pull up the, the I know they're going to have to look for that, the, the foot detox recipe. You can search it in the social media um, handles as well. Thank you for the follows. We got it. We got it. Oh my God. My team is, yes. Let's give them, everybody give them a big clap, clap, clap. Detox foot bath recipe. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So here we go. We have the Vita Tree Vita Detox. We're going to open it up. The full body detox. You're going to open up all those capsules into your bottle. So then just discard the capsules. You don't need them or you could use them for something else. I don't know. And a third of a cup of that sea salt. Okay. And then you're going to mix that. And then you're going to just take a quarter of a cup of that dry mix of the herbal medicines. And you're going to add some apple cider vinegar into a basin with about 10 cups of warm to as hot as you can stand water. And then you're going to soak your feet in that for at least 45 minutes. So if whoever can screenshot this, I know different platforms you can't, but if you're going to want to keep this recipe, you can also look it up on, on like I said, search my name and the, and the detox bath recipe. You can do this as a full body bath, or you can also do it as just a foot bath. And it's amazing what this draws out through your skin and little bugs and parasites and stuff like it, it's amazing to do that detox so taking the detox of course internally is one thing which is amazing and i do recommend you know doing a protocol 
once per quarter, but also uh, doing it as a foot bath. And this is a way to do it for the kids as well, because not everybody wants to, you know, give their children something ingestible for for that detox, but this is a great way to do it. And this is what I do for my kids is soak their feet, pull out the toxins. It's amazing what this does. Okay, so I hope you love that. Um, probiotics questions, yes. Why are Acidophilus and Bifidum are my favorite strains? Okay, so yes, yes. And all you need. Okay, so going back to my training, then extra training as a naturopathic doctor, um, and taking courses specifically in probiotics, these were the strains that always had the most research behind them and the efficacy behind them that didn't have negative sort of downside effects, which um, when you have downstream effects of taking probiotics and sort of messing up your microbiome, that can be a little bit risky for your immune function and things. So these were the ones that, that I used clinically as well. And finding the right strains, uh, you don't, because yeah, there's some, and there's a huge misconception with probiotics. In my experience that, you know, you get these bottles that have different strains and 100 billion of this and, you know, like high, high levels of those different probiotics from different sources. It may have some efficacy, but what I always found clinically, because I experimented with different, yeah, with I hate to say that I experimented with my patients, but, you know, myself, my children, and, you know, my patients, was that, and I didn't experiment, but let's say I had some working and prescription of different types of probiotics that I had available to me and not always getting the results that I would look for. Um, and, and that could be part and parcel because of the fillers that they always use. So any type of probiotic that's in capsule form is usually gonna have this flow agent, the magnesium stearate, which is gonna compromise the proper absorption of that probiotic. But it's just clinically based on my experience and based on the research on those specific strains of acidophilus and bifidobacterium bifidum are the ones that I've always just been more comfortable with and had the most results with clinically with my patients versus some of the other ones like the multi-strain type of probiotics that I had also used. So if that makes sense, um, absolutely. And always making sure that it's acid stable. So here's the thing about probiotics, something that we talked about last week in last week's Dr. Janine show, which of course is on Tuesday. So if you missed it this week or last week, make sure you tune in next Tuesday because we'll be live again at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So just jot that down for yourself. Really important to note that, yeah, your probiotics need to be acid stable, meaning that they bypass that stomach acid, that they've actually been tested to survive the stomach acid and get to the small and large intestine. Um, okay, so I hope that helps. Yes, yes, and question about protein powder. I hope my team can put that in in powder form. Yes, the one that I take is a powder form, absolutely. I see all those hearts coming through. Thank you so much. And all the new followers that are here for the first time, I'm Dr. Janine, welcome on in. This is new, so use the hashtag. So in social media now, start using that hashtag, ask Dr. Janine to populate your questions and things so that our team can find you more easily and quickly across the platforms, which is amazing. And yes, the acid, Sandy June, is the acidophilus and bifidobacterium bifidum. So in that combination is what I look for in the probiotic. My team behind the scenes often, and if you do have specific questions, you, um, actual vitamin questions or supplement questions, can we pull up that slide really quickly? You can send an email uh, to the team at Vitatree, our sponsor for the Dr. Janine show send an email to hello at vitatree.com. So this is a really important email. Ask your questions. Hey, you're looking at a, you know, doing a protocol, the detox that I talked about. You want to look at probiotics. You want to look at, you know, the protein powder. Please send an email to the team here. Fantastic, fantastic team members that can answer your questions. And they're very well aware of all my protocols um, that I share, which there's more information coming down the pipeline for everybody. If you follow, make sure you're following me because yeah, my new book is coming out. We've got protocols and courses and all kinds of fun stuff coming out very soon. So I'm, we're working so, so hard behind the scenes on that, my entire team. So I'm super excited about that. So make sure you're following me and you get on our list and email list and things so that you get first dibs at, you know, the book launch and release and all these things, which is amazing. Um, all right, everyone. Well, thank you so much. Oh, yes. One more. Is your gut related to geographic tongue? Absolutely. So check out my video on that. You can search it up, geographic tongue and what to do about it. You can search that up. Okay, everybody, 
I think we are done for today. It was so great to have you all here. Remember to use that hashtag, Ask Dr. Janine, on Wednesdays. I'll be here whenever I can to answer your questions. If you still have questions that you need answered, make sure that you're putting them in the comments section. Make sure you tune in on Tuesday, and you're going to tune into the Dr. Janine Show Tuesday live at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it will have new topics that we go through next week. We're talking about leptin resistance again, how that's related to our healthy immunity as well, which is always awesome. And of course, other topics as well. We're going to talk about dirty fasting. Okay. So I, I didn't want to talk about it earlier, but we're going to talk about how I do my fasting, dirty fasting. Okay. So make sure you tune in next week on Tuesday. We'll see you there. Have a great week, everyone. It was so great to have you all here today. Thank you for tuning in. And yes, the, there are two lives a week now. So Tuesdays, at 11 a.m. and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Q&A. That's when I go live. Thank you to everybody who was here and who joined and who followed and who shared and love you all. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.